And he took what little faith she had and made wonders with it. None of us have perfect faith. All of us doubt. All of us struggle. Sometimes you may wonder even if there is a God, if this whole thing is a joke. Take what little faith you have to Jesus. Watch what he can do with it. Father in heaven, we thank you for the story that we heard today, the songs that led us in worship, and the one we've just heard that moved our hearts. Lord, we, we want to hear from you. It's a very troubled world we live in, and we're perplexed on many sides, and we want faith in you. We want to push through fear. We want to stand solidly on Jesus as our Savior. And we need constant reassurance of your love and commitment to us. And I pray that everyone that is here or that will hear this sermon, that you will indeed speak to them of your love. And that each of our lives will be affected and changed for eternity. And we ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. The Gospel of Mark chapter 5. The story we are studying today begins with verse 21. Mark 5 verse 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, Little girl, 
I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it, and said that something should be given her to eat. Let's look at the context of this story. The day before, Jesus had been teaching in this very spot all day long, teaching in parables. When evening came, he asked the fellows he was with, let's launch the boat out and go across to the other side of the lake. So they went to the eastern shore. But during the night, there was a tremendous tempest that came down upon them. Jesus was tired and he was asleep in the boat. And they woke him up and Jesus hushed the storm and silenced the wind and the waves. The next day, this very day that we're studying now, Jesus came to shore on the eastern side of the lake. A man came screaming out of the graveyard and ultimately was delivered from a legion of demons who ran into pigs and 2,000 pigs drowned in the sea. And that story ended with the locals asking Jesus to leave. So Jesus left. He came back to the western side of the lake, got out of the boat, and our story takes place there. It's interesting, in Mark 5, verse 17, the story that had taken place earlier that day, it says, then they began to plead with him to depart from that region. They were literally begging Jesus to get, leave them alone. You, you go, leave us alone. So Jesus left them alone. Let's look at verse 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by the boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. So now there is a multitude gathering to him. In Luke 8, verse 40, and we'll switch back and forth a few times. You can if you want in your Bible or just read it off the screen. So it says, so it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. So Jesus is welcomed as he comes back to this side of the lake. They were waiting for him. They wanted him to come. Verse 22, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Verse 23. And begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. He is called one of the rulers of the synagogue. He is a member of the College of Elders. Now these were laymen that were in charge of the synagogue. It may be there were several laymen in charge of a particular synagogue, or it could be that there were several synagogues and people in charge of those. But he is in a position of prominence in Israel. Prominence and respect. It was his job to structure the worship. It was his job to take care of the building. He was paid for doing that and highly, highly regarded and highly, highly respected. It says he came and fell at Jesus' feet. This is not an arrogant show. This is a man humbled by the circumstances of his daughter's illness. He is broken and he collapses at the feet of Jesus. He begs him earnestly to go with him. Now Mark 5, verse 17, which we read earlier, it said to the folks on the other side of the lake, and they began to plead with Jesus to depart from that region. It is the same Greek word. So you have one group of people begging Jesus to leave, and you have this man begging for Jesus to come with him. 
I find that fascinating. That will be the conclusion of all humanity at some point. People hiding themselves from the face of the Lamb, seeking to get away from His wrath, pleading for Him to leave them alone. And you'll have the group pleading for Him to come. Verse 23. This man begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. In Luke 8, verse 42, it says, For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age. She was dying. This is his only daughter. I, I don't know how they've concluded this, but many scholars, the way it's written, have concluded that it's their only child. She's it. She's the entirety of their family. So she is 12 years old. And it is interesting that she was born the same year that the woman in the story got her affliction. Each covers the 12 year time period. She's at an hour of supreme need. When he says, or when it's written, at the point of death, it literally means at the last breath. She is very, very close to perishing. He begs the Lord to come with her. Lay hands on her. Now this man is quite aware of the attitude of the Pharisees and the religious leaders in his country. It is very clear they're seeking to destroy Jesus. His position, likely, is precarious. He could be removed for what he's doing. But he loves his daughter. And his love for his daughter is more important than any position he may hold in the community. Also, Jesus has been working so long and so hard in Capernaum that it is now becoming known as his city. Hundreds have been healed at the hand of Jesus. So this man's faith is properly directed at Jesus. He has heard stories. He likely has seen things happen where Jesus has healed people. So he knows of Jesus' ability. He goes to Jesus with that ability in mind, humbles himself before Jesus, and says, Please, come. Lay your hands on my little child that she might live. Verse 24. So Jesus went with him. And a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now, in Luke 8.42, it is translated the same way. It says, for he had only one daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Luke writes thronged. Mark writes thronged, but they use two different Greek words. And the word here is a bit more descriptive. It literally means to choke. The crowd is so thick that Jesus' progress was choked. He could hardly move. It's just boxed in barely able to make any progress, he is choked. Now, we can only begin to imagine the anxiety of the father. His daughter is at the point of death. He's asked Jesus to come. He believes Jesus can heal. Jesus has agreed to go. Will they get there in time? This has got to be awful for him. The crowd keeps getting thicker and thicker. 
And then she shows up. Where'd she come from? Why are we spending time with her? Verse 25, she is called a certain woman, had a flow of blood for 12 years. It's interesting that Eusebius, who is a church historian writing in the 300s, says that she was a Gentile from Caesarea Philippi. So I don't know if you're picking up on this a little bit, but here the ruler of the synagogue has gotten the ear of Jesus. Basically, he, he's got the promise of Jesus. All he's got to do is get Jesus to his daughter. His daughter will live. But here comes a Gentile woman. Bad enough you're boxed in by all these Jews, but now a Gentile woman is going to stop the whole show. She comes, verse 26. She had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. All her funds were depleted, and she was more and more discouraged than ever before. Verse 27. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. She had heard reports about Jesus. Jesus was there. There was a crowd. And she worked her way to the back of him and touched his garment. Both Luke and Matthew, who record this story, say she touched the border of his garment. There was a blue border, a fringe, the Jews were required to wear to remind them that they were God's people. So this Gentile woman, with a degree of faith, but lack of understanding, kind of mingled with a superstitious idea, reached down and touched that blue hem of Jesus' garment. It was believed, well, let's read it, verse 28. She said, if only I may touch his clothes, I may be well. It was a popular belief that the dignity and power of a person could be transferred to what they wear. Now, this was popular among the Gentiles, but it had seeped into the Jewish population as well. The idea was that if you could just touch their garment, their virtue could come to you. Now, you can understand on the superstitious side of the Gentiles, magic, whatever, good, good enough for them. The Jews kind of reasoned that way because they thought, well, if uh, someone is unclean and their clothes are considered unclean, well, then there's an association with their physicality there. So, well, maybe there's something to it. But this woman is a Gentile. She has a degree of faith, but she also has ideas that are superstitious. Verse 29, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body, and she was healed of the affliction. It happened immediately, and she knew it. Verse 30, and Jesus immediately, same word, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? He knew of her healing. He stopped. And he asked the question, Who touched my clothes? Now, it's a strange question. Because we know Jesus knows everything. But Jesus is going to give this lady an opportunity 
to solidify her faith in him rather than in a superstitious practice. And it's very important for Jesus to do this because, oddly enough, watch what happens when we go to Mark chapter 6, verse 56. We'll, well, look, we'll look at it on the screen. It's about Jesus. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. So this becomes a very popular deal. And Jesus, right at the beginning of it, is going to say, look, it's not faith in clothing. It's not faith in magic. It's not superstition. He's going to say, woman, it was your faith in me that healed you. And others will get that as well. Jesus is going to set the record straight. It is faith in him that heals. It's not faith in practice. It's not faith in policies. It's not faith in anything other than Jesus Christ himself. Verse 31, back in Matthew 5. But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? These guys, they're so slow to learn. The sea had been stilled the night before. The demons been, had been cast out that very morning. And now they're questioning. You see, perhaps they're gaining some faith regarding Jesus' power, but they're not trusting him for who he is, what he says, where he goes, or what he teaches. You see, faith, mature faith, is developed over time and experience with God. Mature faith doesn't question God for every unexpected turn or issue. It trusts him and trusts his sovereignty and can continue moving on in life. These guys weren't there yet. So you have a man with great faith. You have a woman with some faith. And you have these guys who don't get it at all. 5, verse 32. But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude. I'm sorry, that was verse 31. Verse 32. And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. This woman is thinking she must have done something wrong. She has stolen something, perhaps, that she shouldn't have stolen. Maybe it's a little different when you get entirely surrounded by Jewish people, but she is terribly concerned. In verse 34, and he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. The Bible says... When we confess Jesus with our tongue, it does something for us. Jesus gave this woman an opportunity to testify. In his presence, she told him all things. The whole of it. What a faith that is demonstrated by her that she could be totally honest with her Savior. At that time, I don't think she would be aware of any other person around her. There's Jesus, they're talking, she's honest, and Jesus assures her she has done nothing wrong. It's your faith that made you well. You didn't steal anything. It's not superstition. It's your faith in me that has made you well. What a day for her. 
What a day. So we go to verse 35. If this were a movie, the camera now swings back to Jairus. While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Oh, what a punch. It was hard enough, hard enough with the press of the crowd and the time. We got to get there. We got to get there. And then this lady, this Gentile, and now it's too late. We would think it was too late as well. No one had ever seen somebody raised from the dead. They'd read about it in the Old Testament. It happened a few times. No one had seen it. Who could believe it could happen? Verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Wow. Notice the emphasis. <clears throat> as soon, as soon as he heard, Jesus was right there. Right there. Don't be afraid. Have faith. You see, faith always conquers fear. Fear and faith cannot coexist. And this man is being encouraged by the Savior himself. Wow. I can see his arm around him. I can see him looking at him. Don't be afraid. Only believe. And Jesus is going to help the man in his fear. He's going to cut through the crowd. We're going to speed this up. So, Jesus essentially is saying to this man, something is about to happen that no one has ever seen before. Just believe. Do not be afraid. We know from reading the story that Jesus will raise this girl from the dead. Do you know that in the Gospels, Jesus will actually raise people from the dead three times? But every time, it's more progressive. This young girl will be raised to life from her bed. The next incident will be a young man, a widow's son, who is already in his coffin on the way to the grave. And Jesus goes and raises him out of the coffin. The next time Jesus will do it, it is Lazarus, and he's been four days in the tomb. Do you see the progression? And then you have Jesus raised for eternity. Those people died again. Jesus will never die again. And not that it can top it. But the next time, all believers from all the ages will rise from the grave. And that's for eternity as well. Do not be afraid. Only believe. Verse 37. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. So he calls out three. And he will do that three times during his life here at the transfiguration and during his agony in the garden, it will be Peter, James, and John that he will single out. And they will be the eyewitnesses of what took place. Verse 38. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult. It's an uproar. And those who wept and wailed loudly. These are the professional mourners. It was understood in the day that it was the duty of even the poorest Israelite to provide no less than two flutes and one wailing, lamenting woman when there was a death. These people were professional mourners. They didn't even have to know the people, but there was supposed to be sorrow at a death, so they would 
bring these people in and they would wail and carry on and so forth and so on. So there's a tumult there. They're carrying on. Verse 39. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. You know, it just dawned on me right now. That would be a powerful verse at a funeral. Remind me of that, Karen, sometime. But Jesus said, Why make this commotion and weep? This child is not dead, but sleeping. Now, watch what happens here. And they laughed him to scorn. Scorn is an awful word. It is laced with hatred, vindictiveness. They laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he took the father and mother and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Let me say something about this scorn. Jesus suffered the scorn so that the actual death would be more apparent. They are declaring vehemently that child is dead. Do you see the greater victory? Jesus suffered scorn for the greater victory. Wow, what a Savior. So we read on. He puts them out, and he will raise the girl to life. Verse 41. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. The literal, the literal words are, Little maid, arise. Verse 42. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. You think? But look at our Savior. Verse 43. He commanded them strictly that no one should know it, I'm not sure why Jesus does that, but it was important. Maybe he didn't want to be distracted from his mission of teaching. I'm not sure, but he said that. But this is what really strikes me about his person. And said something should be given her to eat. Now here's this 12-year-old girl. She's been sick, and so sick that she actually died. Jesus has raised her from death. She is probably in better shape right then than she's ever been since her birth. But Jesus knows her physicality and said, this girl needs something to eat. He knows our needs. The next word I have in my notes is... Wow. What are some of the lessons we can take with us from this story? Well, I know there are many parents here today that are going to Jesus for help regarding their children. Children that are away from serving the Lord. Sick, if you will. Dying. And they go to Jesus. This is your story. Do you recognize there is nothing said about the girl's faith? Nothing said about the girl's faith. It was the parents' faith that brought Jesus into the situation. Keep praying. Keep praying for your children. I repeat what Jesus said. 
Do not be afraid. Only believe. I think, too, there's the lesson of the Gentile lady's imperfect faith. She didn't, didn't have a great understanding, but she went to Jesus, and he took what little faith she had and made wonders with it. None of us have perfect faith. All of us doubt. All of us struggle. Sometimes you may wonder even if there is a God, if this whole thing is a joke. Take what little faith you have to Jesus. Watch what he can do with it. I also see this lesson in it. Jesus went with the parent who just had a child die. He's with us during our times of pain like that. He draws near. He's whispering words of encouragement and hope. You see, he knows what he's going to do. We don't know it. We've never seen anybody resurrected from the dead. And I don't know, as much as we may love our child, our spouse, ultimately, when we get to heaven, we will be glad they didn't have to die again. Jesus is with us. I see another lesson in here reflected by the disciples' lack of mature faith. You see, mature faith moves away from questioning God at every turn. It moves toward trusting Him, walking with Him, finding rest for our souls, and as Jesus said, go in peace. That's what He wants for us. Every one of us here is faced with things too big for us. Causes an unsettledness, confusion, distress. Jesus, I believe, in this story is teaching us mature faith moves ahead, moves on with unanswered questions. I want you to consider that the next time an unusual, unexpected thing happens and we'll say something negative. What is the first word out of your mouth? It's not a hard question. Why? Am I right? Yeah. Why? A mature faith does not question God at every turn. It trusts him. This setback will be another opportunity to see how God can work. In Mark 5, verse 36, it says, But he commanded them strictly, oops, verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. Now I want you, see those quotation marks? That's what Jesus said. I want you to repeat that out loud with me. Do not be afraid, only believe. Now there's something about a testimony. So I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, do not be afraid, only believe. This story, I believe for us, can be summarized simply by asking a question. How great is our God?
Is he with us? Can he do this type of stuff? Will he raise the dead? Does he heal people who come to him in faith? How great is our God? Today, my appeal is this. Is there anyone here who would like to experience mature faith in the Lord where we are able to go forward in peace. If you want to say to God you want that type of faith, please stand. Father in heaven, we stand before you in reverence, declaring our desire to have a faith in you that doesn't question every single thing. A faith that will hold on. A faith that will help us to go forward without fear, but to move in peace. Help us to know how great you are, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.